Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 17 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. We are, of course, reading Alan Ryan's On Politics, a book summarizing the history of political theory from Herodotus to the modern day. And this time we are looking at the American founding, uh, one of the topics that we probably know the most about uh, in this book. Uh, the True. history of our own country and how it came to be. Uh, what would you think of this chapter overall? It was a good summary. I thought so yeah. too. I mean, because you can uh, you can write forever on this subject. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, good, good summary. Mm-hmm. Yes. I agree. I agree. Uh, but we start off uh, kind of with the discussion of just how unlikely it really was, as Alan Ryan kind of uh, discusses. He says, the creation of the United States was surprising. It was the quote-unquote first new nation, and it was more likely to be a failure than a success. Says the creation of the United States was a human uh, uh, contrivance, but highly intelligent and well-crafted. Um, so kind of saying, you know, it was the product of, of, of these human beings and stuff. It's not just some divine creation, but it was very intelligent and well done. There, says this chapter, I think it was divinely inspired. You think it was divinely inspired? Actually, if anything is divinely inspired, it was this country. <laughs> you think so? I mean, it's, it's brilliant. Huh. Interesting. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? I think I just did. It's It's brilliant. I mean, do you want to elaborate on why you think that is the case? I will later. Okay. All right. But uh, Alan Ryan continues kind of by saying that this chapter aims to describe the founding's theoretical importance, not the practical importance of the what the U.S. has come to be today. He says, you know, we all know the U.S. was very important, you know, just as a practical powerhouse on the world stage. But looking at why the theory is important, um, he covers Thomas Jefferson and the authors of The Federalist and how they attempt to create a non-tyrannical republic on uh, three possible versions across several years. Uh, but he does note that there are several mis- uh, thinkers missing, particularly uh, the lack of the conservative John Adams and the anti-slavery Benjamin Rush. So, of course, there's dozens more authors we can include here, but we're focusing just on three of those. He says, The creation of the U.S. was not simple. Uh, it was very contentious and theory-laden enterprise, and the rebels spoke the language of the radicals of the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and behind them stood the republics of the Cromwellian Commonwealth, and they were founded on Locke's theories. He says English republicanism got a second wind in America. So kind of a lot yeah. of things coming together. At once. Yeah, and, and it's it, it's really fascinating how they had the Articles of Confederation first, and they didn't really have um, a formal requirement to enact the Constitution. Mm-hmm. It's just that the people that were actively involved in the Confederation realized the weaknesses of it. You know that that they they didn't that that the each state was too independent of each other and of the federal government and and uh, and I think that's the only way that the Constitution could have been adopted is mm-hmm. first by try trying and failing this looser confederation meaning like that they were rebelling against England and of course they the I think the other factor which is super important was that they already had. Uh, the English system and the common law system in place in each one of the 13 colonies. And there were, there were separate divisions, the little like provinces of the English empire, really. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or Great Britain or whatever they were at the time. But, and, and because of that, they had a certain stability, even though they broke off from England, they had a certain stability in and among the, the separate 13 colonies. And that was super important because it, it wasn't, I know it was a revolution, but it wasn't really revolutionary. Yeah. You know, they weren't trying to burn down the place. They were just trying to uh, almost really get better representation from a central government that's local. You know, it, 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 it really was almost a miracle that it, that it ever occurred. And once you had it in place, of course, a lot of things had to work out right, especially Washington, George Washington being the first president and leaving after eight years mm-hmm. uh, and uh, really repudiating the you know, the, the people that wanted to make him a monarch. Well, it all kind of goes back to the idea that was very influential on the founding fathers, but the idea that, you know, um, we can get rid of the government and still remain a people. We don't Correct. have to entirely right. uplift or, right. you know, destroy the old culture and replace it with an entirely right. new thing. The people stay the same. We're yes. just choosing a new government to represent us. Yeah, and, and then uh, another factor, which I don't know that he really addresses in his book, was really the, the educational system mm-hmm. such as it was. It wasn't the education system we have now, which is primarily government funded. It was just self-educated people, and and th- their knowledge of uh, Greek and Latin and uh, history and uh, philosophy is just astounding. I mean, um, they knew so much more uh, philosophy 
and uh, political science and history and language than anyone in our current government. Yeah. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean it, well, I mean, there might be a couple outliers that are really smart, uh, well uh, educated. And I don't mean just they have a degree from a nice fancy university. I mean, they really have uh, an understanding of history. It, it's pretty rare, I think, in, in, in uh, today's society to have people like that in a leadership role. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're all of them were. I yeah. mean, almost all of them. It, it's, 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 it's shocking. Um, but anyway, so yes, that's, that's a good a point. Nice little that's rant there point. about uh, the, the. That's the reason why I think it's. I, I guess I'm. I just think it's just so remotely possible. It's almost like there had to have been some sort of divine intervention. But I'm not really saying that God chose the United States, but uh, certainly cer- cer- certainly seems to look like it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh, we then move into to the Declaration and its sources, particularly pointing out, you know, Locke and Sidney's influence here. Mm. Just exactly what you were talking about. They were so well read. They knew so much political theory. And it's very, very clear just in the Declaration of Independence alone. Uh, he says, Locke was particularly influential in the idea that, that if we the people could make kings, we the people could unmake them. Yep. And that's sort of the, the central idea of the entire Declaration of Independence. It's Correct. We the people. Uh, and then along with that. Uh, it also draws on uh, Sydney's idea of natural rights. You know, what do yes. we have innately in us? What can the government not take away? So this is, it includes Harrington's collective liberty and Seneca and Cicero's liberty of self-governing citizens, uh, that the rhetoric, rhetoric of citizen virtue coexists with the rhetoric of natural rights. So being an active yep. participant in your government, you know, and still, you know, keeping those things that are just naturally given to you uh, by just being a human person. Yeah. And they all were big fans of, of Cicero, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, they all they all read his speeches and, and knew him so well, and and uh, and they all knew about Athenian democracy, and and, and um, uh, well, Greek democracies or um, you know governments at that time. You know, all the way through history, they were they were really students of it and really thought about it. You know, how to do this the best way possible, and. Um, there you go. That's better. I can now hear myself. Um, and and the the natural rights is so fundamental, mm-hmm. um, and, and end up being kind of put in the the Bill of Rights, but also you know the preamble to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's mm-hmm. just just so fundamental um, uh, to to the philosophy underlying the entire um, United States government. Mm-hmm. As it, as it was formed. He kind of goes on to say that, you know, they're kind of invoking, you know, every area of knowledge. He says, the Declaration invokes God, history, and philosophy for the mm-hmm. ends it aimed to achieve. Education had taught the founders that revelation reinforced the teachings of nature. They were not uh, concerned with magnifying the differences between Christian and pagan writers, uh, but emphasizing uh, what they had in common, this Correct. idea of the overlapping consensus. You know, yes. look at what's got been gotten right by everybody throughout all of time. What yes. can we do? How can we apply that today? And, and important because there were a number of different religions in place mm. uh, in the United States and the colonies uh, at the time. So, you know, you know, being able to look past that and be able to, to integrate each other into a common uh, government, mm-hmm. so important, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and I think really, the the done the best the first you know i mean i I don't know i mean i guess there were some governments that were tolerant of minority religious uh peoples you know like the jewish faith in some communities in in europe but they were almost separated Mm -hmm. you know so this was this uh that kind of looking for the common themes and the the common uh agreed upon philosophy Mm -hmm. of government was really important yeah Yep. He also says that the combined both like ancient and modern liberty, he says here, reading from the book, mm, America yeah. needed, spo- needed both kinds of liberty. The liberty of the ancients without the liberty of the moderns would destroy economic freedom, violate the rights of conscience, and de- degenerate into the tyranny of the majority. While the liberty of the modern without the liberty of the ancients would deprive the citizenry of the power of self-government claimed by the words, we the people. So this idea of, you know, everybody should be allowed to participate in the government while also, you know, being allowed to just, you know, hold the things dear to them while not having to participate in government necessarily. Right, right. Like, you know, you know the old uh, philosophy of Aristotle is you know, the only uh, proper Athenian. Mm-hmm. It would be somebody that really devoted their, almost their entire life to uh, politics and the government mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. And, and, and the American system is quite the opposite, that most people would not be mm-hmm. paying attention to it all the time. They would be going about their business um, separate from their political life. Yeah. Uh, he goes on to talk about uh, James Madison briefly, who we'll talk about more in depth later, but he emphasized politics in a mean, 
uh, sort of this mm-hmm. idea of sort of the middle road that common sense uh, becomes the, the practice. It says the new constitutional order must be both Lockean and Republican, must protect individual rights against government excess uh, while creating limited but effective government institutions. You know, how do you find that balance? How does the government function while also making sure it doesn't encroach on people's rights? It says the, the tension uh, still existed between those two things, particularly in reconciling slavery with the idea that all men are created equal. So it definitely wasn't, you know, 100% perfect, um, but it was definitely better than, than I think anything that's been created before it. Yeah, or since. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I can't think of a more perfect union. Yeah. I mean, I, I really can't. And, the, and the, I think the, you know, maybe we get into this later, but the, the really the, the, the way they, they, they were all involved in government and governance before creating this. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, and, and I think, you know, if, like if you have any experience dealing with local government or you know, regional government type, type uh, entities, you, 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 what, what they did was so brilliant because there's a fail safe for everything. So like you, you have, okay, you have the House of Representatives. That's really where, you know, the, uh, the common people, and they're elected and they're cycled through every two years, all of them thrown out in two years. So you have this ability to, um, to have control over your representatives. But then you have the Senate, which are, uh, well, back when they did it, they did it right, where they had them selected by the state legislatures. So mm-hmm. they're like representatives of the separate states, the separate sovereign states, and they're in for six years on staggered terms. Mm-hmm. So you can't throw out everybody in government every two years. You're only throwing out everybody in the, the House of Representatives in a third of the Senate. Yeah. And so you have two thirds of the Senate still there, no matter what you do, mm-hmm. every two years. And then you got the presidency that's that's on top, that's the executive but he isn't able to do anything on his own other than run the, the day-to-day operations of the stuff that's funded by the, the House and the Senate. Mm-hmm. And then the funding has to start in the House, uh, which is really the People's House, has more direct relationship, smaller districts, more direct relationship to the, the, to the people. And, 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 but, you know, like so, but, it, you know, so the, but the, they have to pass a, a law through both chambers. And then, of course, the president has to sign it or he can veto it. And then it's two thirds to override the veto. So there's a fail safe. So if everybody agrees or a super majority agrees, you can push anything through. So if there's an emergency, you can get something done quick. But if it's not an emergency where everybody agrees, it can be slowed down mm-hmm. to, to nothing and not be able to do anything until you get that consensus. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really, it, it's, it's like, um, um, it's like a steam, you know, like a like a pot on the stove where you have a lever that that releases the steam before it explodes. You know, and so then there's all sorts of mechanisms in there, and the Supreme Court. I'm of two minds of this. Of course, the Constitution did not delegate to the Supreme Court that they had the ability to declare things mm-hmm. uh, uh, constitutional or unconstitutional, yeah. which is mentioned in the book. Mm-hmm. It mentions John Marshall, the first. It's just created on a whole justice. cloth. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, okay, um, you know, but it makes sense. Mm-hmm. But the, of course, that got carried away. Yeah, and you know, maybe with the current composition of the Supreme Court, they'll ex- exercise more humility. But boy, they really have to change a lot of. Mm-hmm. They have to reverse a lot of decisions yeah. in order to get back to um, their proper role, um, which is not to be nine people in robes, just being like some sort of super government, yeah. which is what they've been doing on a lot of issues, mm-hmm. and and uh, they they feel better about themselves and their posterity. But boy, they're really screwing up this country because yeah. that's not how it's supposed to be set up. What whether you agree with their decisions or not. Mm-hmm. And um, and just to have this, and, and there's a lot of talk. Maybe we'll get to it later, but a lot of a lot of discussion in this about how to avoid uh, the, the tyranny mm. of of factualism Factualism's and all that. We can talk about that a little bit, yeah. I guess. But um, you know, we're in a situation now that we have um, a complete takeover of our federal government by uh, the uniparty, which is both Republicans and Democrats that are just part of the same party yeah. against the rest of us. And they're, you know, they're on the same team, mm-hmm. you know, that they may, they may lose this election or win that election. But, you know, I think did they finally pass another omnibus uh, spending bill, uh, sure. you know, a, a trillion plus thing. I know they're going to uh, might have happened today, but, um, you know, nobody in their right mind thinks that's a good idea, yeah. but they all voted for it mm-hmm. and we're stuck with it. Yep. And, the, and, you know, there's another trillion dollars in debt that we added on to the, the national debt. So what are we going to be up to? Thirty two trillion. Um, that's a low number so we so can, we can go higher than that yeah we're, we're going <laughs> more, to yeah you know 
but but you know he discusses that in his book that you know that that's the 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 way it's set up you have to have uh, a concerted effort by one faction that that is able to control both the house the senate and the white house over a period and the, and the courts yeah. over a period of time uh, long enough to assert your control to destroy the republic and mm-hmm. and really for the last 30 years they've been marching through the yeah. uh, through this system and and we're at a crossroads now, but yeah. we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Yep. Uh, to get back to what we were talking about, uh, he kind of says that American independence was almost inevitable. He says it cannot have been long delayed. Sure. Uh, there were a variety of motivations for revolution, particularly in the ruling of a uh, distracted empire over a very confident uh, and self-organizing uh, people. You know, the, the, the Americans at this time, they had very little help from Britain. I mean, Britain, of course, was important to them, um, but they were very much self-governing at this time. And so for Britain to come over Correct. and say, hey, pay us taxes... It was just ridiculous because Britain had no, you know, real aid to give them in a way. Well, I don't. I, I, that's what the book says. And that's what a common theory is. But you know, when you look at the actual gripes that the Americans had, they were pretty minor, <laughs> relatively. Yeah, yeah, they true. had a lot of independence, and they had the the military umbrella of Great Britain yeah. protecting them and their shipping interests. Mm-hmm. And so to, to expect some payment for that was not unreasonable. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that, that but, but I think the, the author is right that it was inevitable because mm-hmm. you, you, can't, you can't rule um, a separate people that are this independent mm-hmm. um, forever because yeah. eventually they're just going to say, you know what, we can just do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's really what happened, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and they, they fought them off and got lucky, mm-hmm. really, yeah. when it came exactly. down to it. Uh, but he also goes on to say... Um, that uh, none of the founders found direct democracy desirable and neither did they believe in economic equality. Uh, but ec- equality of uh, opportunity was important. Uh, he says, if property rights were secure, then all people could reap the fruits of their labor and then different talents, energy, and luck would lead to different uh, outcomes and things like that, which is, I think, a thing that a lot of people have forgotten uh, in this day. That you know, A lot of people have never known that. That's because true. a lot of people are just ignorant. Mm-hmm. I mean, people in the United States are just ignorant today. <laughs> Uh, th- this was this is just so true, so mm-hmm. obviously true, that that's the only way you can run a society or government. Yeah. And to do anything otherwise, and I'm sure we're going to get to it in future chapters because I know the next one is going to be the French Revolution <laughs> and the rest of those jackasses. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to uh, that's going to be a rantathon on that one. Oh, I bet. But but you're right. They they all had that. Or the authors right. They all had this 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 common philosophy about uh, equality of opportunity. Not the uh, equality of outcome, mm-hmm. uh, and that, and they had a real sense of independence, personal independence from the government, from each other, personal responsibility in a fundamental way. I mean, it's it's almost hard to believe that there was an American society that 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 was that self sufficient, yeah. um, that ever existed mm-hmm. because we just aren't. I mean, of course, we have a lot more people and all that stuff. I get that, but it really is astounding. They all had this that philosophy, and that's the fundamental basis of a lot of the government and certainly about the economic policy early Mm -hmm. on yeah absolutely he then concludes by saying this chapter focuses on jefferson and the declaration the creators of the constitution and the jeffersonian and hamiltonian roads not taken so we're starting off with thomas jefferson Mm -hmm. and the declaration of independence Uh, so to get right into that jefferson was born in 1743 and died just hours before john adams on july 4th 1826 50 years after the issuing of the uh, of the declaration uh, he came from a moderately prosperous family and studied philosophy with William Small at the College of William and Mary, uh, from whom he absorbed the moral sense theory of the Scots philosophers. He was educated as a lawyer and elected to the Virginia legislature at 26, which was dissolved by the British governor in 1774, but reconstituted itself as an assembly of the people of Virginia and sent Jefferson to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And he spent the rest of his life in the public eye as a politician and, of course, as president, but died deep in debt and sold his library to Congress, founding the Library of Congress towards the end of his life. Uh, so kind of sad that he died very deep in debt. Well, not really, because he spent it on himself and on That's books true. and stuff. And, and uh, he's, he's uh, uh, But it also kind of, I think, in a way, kind of helps explain his sympathy for the, the uh, stupidity of the... Uh, uh, French Revolution, mm. you know, it was like, oh, liberty, equality. And, uh, you know, it's the same kind of attitude. Well, somebody's going to provide for me. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, what I found most compelling about that little summary was it reminded me that that the Virginia legislature, the people of Virginia, you know, they, they got disbanded by the, mm-hmm. by the uh, king 
And they said, oh, yeah, you know what? We're going to form our own assembly <laughs> because our authority comes from us, yeah. right? It, it, doesn't co- it doesn't derive from you. And that's mm-hmm. just so revolutionary and so true yeah. and, um, and, and so important to, at some point, you guys got to defy their, uh, the, your rulers and just say, you know what? You don't have the, the right to say we can't assemble. Mm-hmm. We can't make our own laws and regulate our own activities. Um, and, but, of course, it was very dangerous, too, yeah. because that's treason and they could get hung you mm-hmm. know, for that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, He goes on to say that his first writings in favor of a break with Britain uh, was a summary view of the rights of British America, and he used Cicero's De Officis to state that George III's kingship was a matter of public appointment. Uh, Mm -hmm. So this idea that, you know, we essentially appoint you as king through, I mean, some roundabout ways, but but the the core message there is that we, the people, did that. Uh, But he says that the supreme magistrate is an agent of common good and should protect the welfare of the people. Uh, And if that's not happening, then you're not really the supreme magistrate. Uh, and interestingly, he invoked the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, yeah. He says when they conquered Britain and set up their own government, uh, they never considered themselves governed by whoever governed them before. He says assistance from one nation to another also does not give uh, the giving nation sovereignty over the uh, receiving. He says Americans are self-governing freeholders, and the British government should recognize that. He says you know, right. just because you are providing us this aid doesn't mean that we inherently owe you something. You know, we've set mm-hmm. up our own government just because right. you're helping us out doesn't mean that you know we are part of you or we are under you. Yeah, uh, we may owe you, mm-hmm. but we we aren't subjects yes, of you. Yes. You know, you you don't rule over us. Even if we have some transactions and maybe stuff goes back and forth, or you or you give us some things mm-hmm. as a gift, it, yeah. which is which of course it was revolutionary at the time. But it's but it's true. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it, if you have a people, that's another thing. You have to have a people that generally agree on some mm-hmm. general philosophical ideas. In the, in, in this case. Uh, you know the role of government and society and and and, uh, and it self uh, uh, independence, mm-hmm. self supporting independence. Yeah. If you didn't have that, this would never work. Mm-hmm. He goes on to say that the summary view is, is a petition of sorts, but it's not a petition of very you know happy subjects. You know, just asking their king for favors. You know, they right. were angry. They right. were demanding that they, he has no sovereignty over them at all. Yes, and which I think is a is a good point to make. They're not mm-hmm. just saying, "Hey, stop taxing us." They're saying, "Hey, stop ruling us." Yeah, and at some point, we're going to have to do that to some aspects of our federal government. Yeah, you know, because you know, like at some point, we have to say that to our Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're just not going to follow your rules. Yeah, absolutely. you and what army? <laughs> but I mean, only the United oh, States yeah. Army, I guess. Probably because the president's lockstep with them. Mm-hmm. Bastards. <laughs> I should probably stop cussing. Isn't this supposed to be like a, a non-cuss yeah, podcast? Fine. Nobody listens Nobody anyway. listens, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Uh, but he says uh, that the Declaration today has become an example of the American identity, uh, more so than just a list of grievances against Britain. Mm. He says it did not uh, announce new principles, but reminded uh, the reader what they already believed. Uh, and he kind of says here uh, that uh, government exists to secure the natural rights of individuals, these being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that if an existing government fails for long enough and badly enough, the people must remove it and institute another. That is the core message of the Declaration. He says, you know, that right. is a core belief of the American people mm-hmm. still to this day. Um, and he goes on to say that uh, it had a precursor in Virginia's Declaration of Rights in June 1776. And the, lo- uh, the logic is based on Locke's theory of revolution in the Second Treatise. It assumes the idea that a people remains even if the government is dissolved. So again, what I was mentioning earlier, you know, if we get rid of the government, we are still Americans. Correct. We are not tied to this government. We're we're Missourians. Yes, 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 exactly. (laughs) Uh, They're Americans. (laughs) We're not Illinoisans. Um, Well, that's the truth. (laughs) Although I was born there, yeah, they were, you were I was at one born time there, and yeah. I lived there. And um, but uh, I repudiate that uh, <laughs> citizenship, the Illinois citizenship. Well, that's where I went to law school. Mm, that is true. Yeah, suffered through that for three years. <laughs> uh, he also says that the litany of complaints within the Declaration was conventional. He says by the time the Declaration was written, war had been ongoing for more than a year, uh, and the colonists won due to Britain not adequately devoting the necessary resources. He says the colonists also received uh, French assistance at Yorktown especially, uh, because the French were happy to distract Britain and get revenge for the Seven Years' War. They weren't really, you know, supporting the Americans. They were just spiting Britain, I yep. think, more so. Which, True, yeah. Which is pretty much reason. what we do now around yeah. the world. You know? <laughs> I mean, why are we supporting Ukraine? Are we, are we really supporting the Ukrainian people, or are we just sticking it to Russia? Yeah. I think probably it's just probably, sticking it to Russia. But mostly the latter of the yeah. two. So. He also says that the British were right not to waste resources. He said there would have been no peace without independence. He says the intellectual question of this revolution was answered not by the Treaty of Paris in 1783 to 84, 
uh, but it was by the new constitution. You know, we're not just yep. focusing on the war here. What's the actual theory uh, mm-hmm. behind this? And that is the constitution, of course. So that is where we get uh, from independence to the first new nation, starting to talk about the con- constitution itself. But first, of course, as you mentioned, we have to talk about the Articles of Confederation of yes. 1781. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they provided a common foreign uh, and defense policy and declared a union of individuals, individual states uh, to be perpetual. He says that each state had one vote in a unicameral Congress. There was no common executive, no Supreme Court. Members of Congress uh, were appointed by state legislatures, and there was no central c- control over the money supply. So it was very Doesn't much... it sound pretty good? I mean, maybe we should go back to that. <laughs> These days it does sound pretty good. <laughs> Although our, we wouldn't be able to really, and that's part of the problem, you can't really fund a common defense mm-hmm. uh, in that manner. And, and uh, But, uh, boy, it, it sounds a lot better. Yeah, it's much more of just the states kind of doing whatever they want um, which, you know, almost preferable in some ways, but like you said, it's, you know, some issues does not help. Well, the, the problem, uh, you want know, a little rant, well, a brief rant. Brief rant. The problem is that the, the states are supposed to be the primary authority mm-hmm. for the, for the vast majority of the services or the, or, or the police power, uh, of government in, in our system. And in the last 100 years, yeah. Uh, that that has been inverted so that everybody, if there's some sort of crisis, everybody looks to the federal government to solve it. And that is not how it's supposed to be set up. And that's how we've become, we got in this pickle Mm -hmm. where the federal government has to subsidize everything. Well, you can't, you can't go on forever because there's only so much money going around and we're trying to pay for everything so that the federal government can, could, can support everybody. Uh, individuals, groups, and and states. It's like, well, you know what? Maybe you should uh, raise your local taxes to to fund better schools in your community. Mm -hmm. Or better yet, don't even have schools. I'm starting to wonder why we even have schools. Yeah. Why do we have public schools? What do they even do anymore? Why don't we just have... Why why do we have public schools, but we have private daycares? Mm. You know, we have to pay for that. And then... You know, why we have that, but we have you know, all these other services, all these you know, like gym memberships. We have all these other things. We we just pay for services as needed. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be better if we just had decentralized control over all schools and just not fund them anymore? Am I, am I crazy about saying that? Uh, or at least maybe I mean I mean maybe on the local level you could just have like like the school choice people are like, well, if you have a kid, here's so much for money for to educate them. If yeah. you want to, so you, you know. Spend it on homeschooling materials, or you, you 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 take them to school or something. But having having these school districts where we're we're throwing gobs of money, and then the federal government puts all these regulations on you, mm-hmm. and, and curriculum from the feds in Washington D.C. Does anybody think that they know education curriculum better than than I do? For crying out loud, I don't know, I don't know what they're damn. And if you look at educational performance, I should, I'm going to say this: I'm completely off the rails. Yes, this I know that's all right, but I'm going with it. Educational perform the, the Department of Education didn't even exist until mm-hmm. Carter, yeah. And the, the performance in our educational system has declined almost every year, if not every year, since the Department of Education was created. Yeah. And, and and so we really need to divest mm-hmm. all of that stuff. Well, it's also like, from the federal government down to the states. Well, to make it more more topical, of course, you had all of the nonsense with COVID shutdowns. Oh gosh. And it's like these schools that were just mandated, you know, by the federal government. They were not. Well, they, they were, were not. not mandated by the federal government. None of not. them were. Sorry. The federal government never had the authority and never asserted the authority yes. that they could shut down anything local. But the school the districts... 15 days to stop the spread was just a guideline issued by President mm-hmm. Trump as a, I don't even think it was an executive order for crying yeah, out loud. So. It was advice. Yes. It was the local people <laughs> that just deferred yes. to the federal government. Sorry. It was the state officials that just followed them mm-hmm. as if they were sheep to a slaughter in a in Infuriates yes. me when anybody makes the mistake that you just did yes. that the federal government shut anything down. They didn't do a damn thing. Mm-hmm. And and Fauci, I'll agree with him on one thing that that he said, I never shut down any schools. Because mm-hmm. he's right. He's just some dummy bureaucrat in Washington, DC with zero power. Yes. Literally has zero power over anybody except for how to fund uh, uh, labs in China yes. that create tremendous pandemics that kill millions of people. Yes. That's what he can do. To, to get back to my point, my point still stands because all of these these state boards are, are just so deferential to, yes. to the national government. Yes, yeah. that that's the point I was trying to make. They were not you know governed federally mandated. Of yes, 
Um, but it was just this idea that, you know, we are so dependent on everything that the federal government says and we can't do anything about it or we think we can't do anything yes. about it. And that's the issue there. It's like those things set back kids, you know, two years yes. in, in some places because it's just, well, we'll just listen to what they say. Yeah, and, and, and now you see these kids' yes. behavioral issues and just dropping and, grades yes. and nobody has any drive anymore. And that deference would have never occurred 200 years ago. Yes. It, it was, are you crazy? You're going to tell us to do what? Mm-hmm. For what? And, and and the fact that none of them made an, any independent analysis of the risk, you know, the risk uh, reward of any of these measures. They just said, well, CDC's advice is, mm-hmm. Was the Centers for Disease Control? They're the experts. No, they're not. They're idiots. Every last one of them are idiots. <laughs> they're either idiots or corrupt or both. Or both. I think they could be both. Yeah, you could be a corrupt idiot. They're very good at being corrupt. Yes. That's about it. It's like, oh, that just drives me crazy. I am this close. I am this close to running for the local health board. Oh, <laughs> the, no. the, the filing closes Friday. There are already seven candidates for three spots. Three of them are running. Are incumbents running for re-election, and and if I could, if I'm, 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 your mother would kill me if she if I was thinking about this, and I really well, she's don't right outside this door. I really she's don't probably want, listen. I don't want to, but we, what what I they need to do is they need to establish a policy that that no federal guidelines will be followed until after an independent determination was made mm. that those guidelines were accurate and they should be followed. Mm. And that was what the missing ingredient was throughout the entire pandemic at all levels of government. No one should have just blindly followed the federal government and everybody blindly followed the federal government. And yes. it was a crime and people should be going to jail mm-hmm. for long periods of time. I would not be opposed to, to uh, prosecuting them for treason and lining them up and executing them. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, my God! Uh, what 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 person mm-hmm. has done more damage to this country than that group of dipshits that that shut down our country for two years, including Trump? Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm officially, I, I I well maybe not officially. I am darn near close to being anti-Trump mm-hmm. because the more I think about how he put those dummies in charge. Yeah. As much as they could be in charge, and he let the and he was talking about how terrible the pandemic was and how great the vaccines were and all this other stuff, and he never did look at the data. Mm-hmm. That idiot, that idiot, put us into that this mess, mm-hmm. and and he wants to be president again. Why on earth would we make him president yeah. if that's what he did the first go round? All right, End good rant. rant. That, that's a couple that, good rants. A couple there. good rants. But you mentioned COVID. You never mentioned COVID to me <laughs> when I'm on air because you know it's going to be at oh, least yeah. a half hour. <laughs> uh, it's like 15 minutes. Uh, back to the articles of Confederation. I got more. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, we'll get to them. Um, uh, the post-war depression and aggressive demands from creditors uh, mm. uh, s- supported Shays' Rebellion in 1776, or sorry, sparked Shays' Rebellion in 1770, 1786. I'm getting all my numbers wrong. Yes. Um, but this influenced public opinion to the point that pretty much everyone agreed that the articles were not effective. So it was primarily uh, economic concerns. Well, yeah, it was a financial issue. system can't be supported uh, when you have each state doing their own thing. You yeah. don't have any sort of central bank, which I, I don't, I, I'm really not in favor of the current Fed, but, but you don't have any sort of a central financial institution that you can rely upon to fund anything. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, businesses big and small are failing because yeah. of the, the currency tightens up. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in a barter system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 provided a more perfect union. And this was only belatedly blessed by the Continental Congress. Uh, initially, this convention was only uh, to suggest changes to the articles, not replace both the articles and the Congress. Right. So all these people in Congress were like, what? You did what? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> We're out of a job. That's right. Um, but then they realized, I guess, that it was just better than anything that they'd come up with to that point. Yeah. And, and if you look, it's not mentioned in the book, but you know, it was all done in secret. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, uh, they did not have public meetings and it was in Philadelphia. And of course, they didn't have air conditioning. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, I think that their stories of the flies were terrible. Yeah. And so it was super hot. Well, because they had the windows closed. They had to have the windows closed. So they, couldn't, yeah. Yeah, they couldn't let anybody listen in. Man, it was just... <laughs> And I, I don't like that, you know, just my sense. I, I'm a very much an open government type of guy, but uh, I can't argue with the results. Yeah, you know, that's true. maybe they just needed to hash it out in private so that they can, you know, talk freely. And mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like it leaked too much, but yeah. um, but any interesting. Yeah. Uh, but this uh, new constitution that was provided by the Philadelphia Con- Convention uh, provided a bicameral legislature 
Of course, a lower house based on population with two-year terms and an upper house with two senators per state uh, with six-year terms. It also created a permanent executive, although its tasks were somewhat uncertain uh, in this initial constitution. And it also established the Supreme Court. And although its powers were uh, were unclear, uh, like I said earlier, Chief Justice John Marshall seized the right to declare legislation unconstitutional. And so this idea of separation of powers and checks and balances were inter- integral to the Constitution. Those are the two big things is the separation of powers and checks and balances. Yeah. And if we were to change the Constitution now, mm-hmm. I think the one thing that we would we would need to do is have a procedure for the legislature and executive to overrule the Supreme Court. Hmm. You know, maybe have three quarters or maybe yeah. maybe a two thirds and the president, mm-hmm. you know, maybe two thirds in the president, because that's like a veto yeah, uh, you know, if if you the president and two thirds of the Congress yeah. uh, want to reverse the Supreme Court, they should be able to do it's it. It's interesting because there's there's, really... there's no fail safe for yeah, that. That's... that's just it, and you're stuck with it until you can replace those judges and get somebody else with that's some just, sense. That's in what there. I was just about to say. There's right. really no check on the Supreme Court themselves, I guess, because um, they the never envisioned. Thinking, yeah. they never envisioned the Supreme Court would assert that authority. Mm-hmm. They never even thought of it. Possibly, it was never discussed. Yeah. And this was asserted out of whole cloth. Yeah. They just made this crap up, and that's why it's a it's a gaping hole. If they would have thought of it, mm-hmm. I'm sure they would have had a procedure for the for the legislature and the executive to to team up like similar to what I just said, yeah. so that you have a fail safe. Everything else has a fail safe. Mm-hmm. If you veto something, they can override it. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if 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 this if the Senate goes crazy on something, the House won't won't sign off on it. You know, I mean, there's there's everything. You know, everything has checks and balances, and you can only do so much. But if you all agree, it'll get done, mm-hmm. except for the Supreme Court. Yeah. We could all agree. In fact, it, it was it was a minority view that gay marriage should be legal. Mm-hmm. But the Supreme Court said, Poop, constitutional right. It's yeah. all legal everywhere. Mm-hmm. Everywhere, anytime, in every state. And every state has to recognize the other states that have gay marriage. Yeah. And I mean, it's crazy. They just made that up. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, well, I'm not arguing whether gay marriage should or shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, uh, but <laughs> but but uh, but that ruling was just insane, mm-hmm. just yeah. insane, well, it and it back. was a usurpation mm-hmm. of the constitutional order. They should have been removed from office. Yeah. They should have been impeached and removed by everybody. It should have been a unanimous vote, mm-hmm. because even if you're in favor of that position, you should have recognized that they were usurping the authority yeah. of our elected representatives. Yeah. It's like you were saying, the only way to get rid of them is either through impeachment, which yes. is just a ridiculously long... Well, it's not, not that really. hard. It's not that really? hard. It's not that hard to impeach a judge. Hmm. They just don't do it because they're scared. Hmm. They're scared. Well, I don't want to be seen as interfering in, in cases. Well, why not? Hmm. If, if a judge is out there making stupid decisions... You just, you do the, the a majority of the House has to, it's just like the presidency. The majority of the House has to vote to impeach and the Senate convicts and they're mm. gone, period. Mm. And it yeah. only happens when they get caught, bri- get taken yeah. bribes or they rape somebody or something and then they get impeached. But it's real quiet because yeah. they don't want to impeach the, the integrity of the rest of the yeah. corrupt yeah, judges. What I was, was going to say judges. is like this idea that they'd never imagined that happening. Under the Articles of Confederation, the highest court was like, a, a maritime court, just Correct. things that happened outside of state boundaries. In the sea. In the sea. That's right. And so I, I'm assuming, you know, I, I don't know what the founders exactly were thinking, but I, I'm assuming they thought it would be something like that, just things that apply just across states or and stuff like that, just cases that apply at a federal level. Well, they have, they, they have jurisdictional yes. limits yes. within the Constitution, which is, which is uh, uh, basic, I mean, simply stated, uh, disputes between c- citizens mm-hmm. of the separate states. Yes, exactly. Uh, above a certain threshold. Or uh, states suing each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to remember what the other one was. Uh, treaties yeah. uh, involving claims regarding treaties, and 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 so yeah, it it was it was and and everybody nobody really pays attention to the fact that the Supreme Court is just deciding one case. Mm-hmm. They they it doesn't apply to anybody other than the parties. Yeah, but we've we've just all agreed that it mm-hmm. applies to everybody. You know, because the gay marriage case is one dude yeah. or two dudes. Or maybe it was two girls. I can't remember. But it was their claim that they should be able to have the right to marry. Well, really, technically, if, if that if that happens at a local trial level, mm-hmm. well, it's so, somebody's suing somebody. And so if they win, they get money or they get the relief they asked mm-hmm. for in that case. Yeah. But the Supreme Court asserts that it applies to everybody in, across the United States. Mm-hmm. That's or, what I'm saying. It doesn't like, say that anywhere in the Constitution. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's the point I was making. It's just this idea of, well, they would just be like any other court ever, just with a Correct. bigger jurisdiction. Right. But well, now they're asserting themselves. Now district, you know, federal uh, district judges 
have, have asserted uh, power over immigration law as it applies to all 50 states. They got the crazy Hawaiian judge that kept shutting down Trump's wall. Uh, and he'd do an injunction across the entire United States. And he's a stupid trial judge. Should have been impeached. Mm-hmm. Of course, Another good was not. Yes. yes. Uh, back to uh, the chapter here. We're moving into federalism, this idea of yes. you know, how the Constitution actually functions. Uh, but he says, America needed a system of mutual checks, uh, sacrificing speed of action for the sake of securing as wide of assent as possible, ensuring that the federal government doesn't tyrannize states and ensuring that states don't just engage in democratically driven misbehavior. He says the solution was novel and it was this idea of double sovereignty. So citizens were directly acted on by two separate but coordinate authorities under arrangements designed to ensure that neither was simply the agent of the other and that citizens never found themselves facing contradictory demands from the two authorities to which they owed allegiance. I said state, ag- state governments, state governors are not agents of the president and state law cannot be appealed on non-constitutional grounds in federal courts. A lot of policing is needed to ensure that neither side oversteps the line, but the object is always the same to protect the sovereignty of each authority and to ensure that the citizen is not faced with contradictory demands. This idea that there are two powers essentially above us, but they don't contradict each other. They're, they're separate in a way. Correct. And, and people have no idea that each state is a sovereign. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a lot of overlapping uh, uh, criminal law jurisprudence. Like, so if I it, it technically, in some circumstances, I can commit one murder and be prosecuted three times. Mm-hmm. Because if I shoot somebody across the Mississippi River into Illinois and kill them, I could be prosecuted in Missouri, Illinois, and the feds. Yeah. Um, depending on the circumstances. But uh, I, I was just about to go on another rant mm-hmm. about federal criminal justice system and them usurping the authority yes. of local authority. I'm just going to let it go for let's, now. Let's stick with the yes. federalism. Yes. He says, anti-federalists wanted less government, a weak executive, and a minimalist state with no military or territorial ambitions and as little power as possible to throw, throw from localities to the, uh, to the national government. Um, and so because there was this, this vocal uh, group of anti-federalists, the Federalist Papers were written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison primarily uh, to persuade the waverers to support the Constitution of 1787. So yes. this was written after the drafting of the Constitution, persuading, uh, I suppose it was the Continental Congress at the time. Well, they were, they were public uh, pamphlets, so yes. it was the public generally, yes. and then also the re- you know the, the, mm-hmm. then through the representatives and all that. Yes. And uh, have you ever read the Federalist Papers? I have not. Gosh, I've been meaning to. It's hard. Really? So hard. Uh, I thought you were about to say they're great. Nah, I can't read them uh, because they use kind of like that old English. You would probably love it. Oh, I'm sure you probably would love it. I'm reading but, Bullfinch's mythology, but it's it, yeah, great. Um, <laughs> but it's really hard to read just because of, of the way they articulate their views. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, but it's interesting because you know Hamilton when he writes, and I have I haven't read. Well, I, mean, I might have read all of them at one point, but. Um, but Hamilton is such a strong proponent of a central government. Madison is not so, but they they had the the uh, the need to articulate how uh, the, the those those uh, desires of a str- strong federal government and also empowering the public it had to be articulated. Mm-hmm. That there's a balance between those, but you still had to. Have, you know, basically, the Continental Congress didn't work, and mm-hmm. everybody recognized it didn't work. Well, why? Because they didn't have enough central authority. However, Madison really spelled out, look, you know, even with this stronger central authority, there's all these checks and balances. There's all this popular control over these officials that they can't run away with everything unless mm-hmm. they control all three branches, which is, of course, now what we have. Yes. Uh, but moving but into it took James. us a long time yes. to get this d- 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 to generate the constitutional <laughs> system. Generate. That's right. Um, but moving into James Madison, uh, he was born in 1751 to a moderately prosperous family, studied at the Calvinist College of New Jersey at Princeton, a uh, product of the first Great Awakening. Uh, and this was this idea that original sin is the central reality of human life. Uh, and this became popular at this time, particularly among the Calvinists. Course, so today. important. Yes. I think so important for the, the fundamental understanding of the Constitution is just that there were all fallen mm-hmm. creatures and that, that nobody's going to be, you're not going to, like they talk about later in this chapter, you're not going to have a succession of heroes. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to be able to have a system that normal, ordinary people of of general, you know, ability and, and morality will still be able to function in the system. Uh, and you don't need supermen to do it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, but he actually graduated Princeton in two years and stayed for graduate study. This was interesting. He was probably the first graduate student in the entirety of the United States. I don't yeah. know that was that was a thing. It was interesting. Well, there weren't a lot of colleges back That's then. That's true. Uh, 
but he says that he then became member of the Virginia legislature, but was not reelected, um, but was still sent to the con- con- Continental Congress in 1780 as part of the Virginia delegation. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was still popular among them, even though he was not reelected. And after the war, he served in the Virginia legislature, became the father of the Constitution, as he was responsible for basically calling together the con- Convention of 1787. He succeeded in getting a Constitution through the Convention and worked to secure its acceptance by the reluctant state. So he was mm-hmm. very much um, one of the most critical people working on the Constitution, yeah, if, not if not the, the most. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he wrote a lot of it, mm-hmm. um, if not all of it, really. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. Uh, he understood the degree to which states had to stand up for the rights without uh, shaking a federal structure and maintaining an active and energetic central government. Uh, and then we kind of get this idea of the Bill of Rights. He was hesitant about it because he, he kind yeah. of assumed, you know, well, if it's written on paper, how's that going to stop anybody? Correct. This idea of, you know, if, if we do just believe that these things are innate within us, that should just be within the Constitution itself. And that, right. that, that's been spelled out in the Constitution as he saw it. Says, right. We don't really need the Bill of Rights. But then he realized he needed the, the popular support was there right. for it. He needed to reassure the people. Yeah, that was, that was the compromise to get it passed, yeah. really, to, mm-hmm. to articulate it. But and, and I thought there was a certain amount of trust <laughs> with all those guys. And, of course, it only meant a lot to participate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always thought it was interesting how the the Constitution was ratified and then amended immediately. Yeah. You know, I just thought it was kind of an interesting Mm -hmm. deal rather than um, um, making changes first. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I guess they didn't want to, I guess they had an agreement in principle about how the Constitution, because really the Constitution really talks about how the the government functions. Mm -hmm. And then the Bill of Rights is really... Okay, that's how it functions, but you can't do this this group of ten things. Mm-hmm. So I guess it makes a certain amount of sense. But yeah. the fact that they ratify it and then they amend it immediately, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, weird, that's strange. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was a very successful Secretary of State under Jefferson, helping bring about the Louisiana Purchase. He says he was decisive when decision was needed, but more hesitant to use presidential powers when he was elected as president. Only reluctantly conceding the need for a central bank later on. He tried to avoid the War of 1812 as much as possible, but was successful uh, in keeping up uh, American morals and attitude towards the war uh, to this day. He says, mm. you know, Ma- Madison is pretty much responsible for the American idea today that the War of 1812 was, was almost a victory for yeah, us. It really wasn't. Yeah, they it burned wasn't. our capital. Yeah, they did. They, they absolutely <laughs> did that. Uh, but he says his career between the end of his presidency in 1817 and his death in 1836 was quiet and agreeable. Although at the age of 70, 78, he was called back to take part in redrafting the Virginian Constitution uh, and at this time was devoted to expanding the franchise. He kind mm. of ends by saying he was able to think of nuance throughout his entire life. You know, he was yeah. always a very, you know, looking at both sides of the issue, you know, not just looking at what he just wanted particularly, but, you know, what is the best thing to do? Yeah. What is the most nuanced take? I think he really is underappreciated. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, like we're in Jefferson County now yeah. and our capital of Missouri is Jefferson City. Mm-hmm. Everybody loves Jefferson because he's the author, so-called, of the uh, Declaration of Independence. But Madison's a real hero, you mm-hmm. know. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of famous Madisons like places. In, oh, Madison, in, Wisconsin. Madison, there's a lot Wisconsin. of Madisons, but there's a bunch of streets named after him. Yeah, but but in true. contemporary culture, of course, now we have Hamilton because yeah, the, because uh, of the, the musical. The musical. Um, and so people are like, oh, who's Hamilton? Something uh, about Hamilton always rubbed me the wrong way, but we'll, we'll get into that. Was it the bad music? Oh, the bad. I'm not talking about the play. Oh, I'm talking oh, about the oh. guy. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, because it was, it was like a, a partially black. Is that what you're saying? You don't like the blacks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, really? Because, uh, well, he was high strung. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Mm-hmm. And he died, I think, pretty young. Well, yeah, because the, the duel it, with Aaron Burr. Yeah, I mean, he was a really, you talk about a self-made guy. He came over uh, from, uh, what was the island he was in? They're in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, and uh, and basically supported himself and self educated himself and became a very influential person, mm-hmm. and and all his theories, as the book alludes to towards the end, yeah. about needing a central bank to finance things, uh, really was was absolutely right on. And when he was arguing about those things, it, it he was right. Yeah. Um, no, he was not right about that Washington be, should become king, and he always wanted a monarch mm-hmm. and he's a central yes, government. So he's wrong was, about yeah. that. But maybe it is but, just Lin Manuel Miranda and in the the musical. Oh yeah, so it's horrible. It's yeah, unwatchable. I hate that music, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, we watched it together, yeah, not live, but on on TV. Yeah, I think yeah. I think I tried. To, I kept my mouth shut during the whole you did, performance. You did, yeah. which is impressive for you. And for I didn't. A movie. I didn't. I don't think it. Re- it didn't really have plot holes yeah. and that kind of stuff. I just thought because well, it was just kind of true. 
This is kind of what happened. Well, yeah. With some liberties taken. Yeah, out. sure, sure. Dramatization in yes. songs. Yes. I don't think they sang those songs. I don't, I, <laughs> you're right there, Dad. Uh, uh, unlike... Uh, Avatar 2, mm, which was, we don't was need nothing to, but plot holes. We don't need to get into Avatar 2. Uh, we need to get into the Federalist and what these papers actually said. This was a long section. Uh, but he says, uh, Madison was firmly anti-utopian. So yes. that's like one of the first things he says in this section. I'm like, that is something that you will appreciate. And I did. Um, I do. He, and I did. And he, has no, he said he had no enthusiasm for politics itself. Uh, he understood the frailty of human nature and so feared uh, a rational greed. This idea that, you know, we're all innately, you know, um, uh, did you just spill water on my bed? I did. I, that's great. It's a big wet spot. Yeah, that's fantastic. I swear it's water. Yes, but <laughs> that's gross. Uh, but he feared this rational greed of people, and so he believed that institutions must operate on the basis of setting one self-interest against another. Uh, he says there's always an issue of factions, and that's what we'll really get into with Madison here. He yes. says the Constitution achieved two things. First, it established a genuinely federal government on the basis of powers granted by the whole people, uh, the collective national will was behind government and the laws. He says it was truly a government of rights. Uh, and that is what was firmly based on what are the rights of the people in this government. And that is the foundation. Uh, he also said he did this without demanding extraordinary virtue of anyone. He says just a public spirited men with virtues of decent farsighted Americans would do very well in running this government. You don't have to be, you know, the Achilles to, to, to run this government. Right. And that's the key mm-hmm. to, to understanding the checks and balances in the federalist system is that, um, you're expecting mm-hmm. people to be sinners. You're expecting yeah. them to be part of a faction where uh, from time to time, they're going to be wrong mm-hmm. and they're going to be purposely wrong. Uh, and recognizing that as a reality of life, I think is the, f- is the foundation mm-hmm. of this constitution that that's just the way things are. Yeah. And you can't, you may be able to, to luck out and have like, well, who was the thinker a couple chapters back where they uh, they're, they're saying you have to have some really almost you know, almost quasi divine mm-hmm. uh, t- uh, monarch to get. Machiavelli was one yeah, of those. Yeah, that yeah, he yeah, echoed yeah, by yeah, a couple people. Yeah, you had to have somebody that was of of, of great character to, mm-hmm. to create the nation, and then it's up to the rest of them to follow to keep it going. Yeah, but you had to have somebody of such moral standing to to get to get started. And, and Madison uh, recognizes, and the other uh, founders of the Constitution recognize that and, and agree with that argument that you have to have a system set up that will practically work, knowing that we're 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 going to make mistakes, mm-hmm. and we need to be able to correct the mistakes or stop the mistakes. You know, so a minority can stop the mistakes of a, of a majority uh, faction, um, and and that's that's so. Mm-hmm. Uh, unique, I think, yeah. in in uh, in government. Certainly, it was the first time that it was really espoused in that manner. I think. Uh, but he goes on to say that Madison had to reassure the readers of the Federalists that the government was sufficiently popular. This idea that you know, it is a federal government, but it is based on the people. It was answerable to the people in the sense that any position of authority could be filled by persons from any rank in society. It's not right. an aristocracy. You don't have to be rich. Um, you just have to be able to uh, well to be a man, a white man at this time. I think you had to be age. a landholder too. Probably. Time, but, to vote. Yeah. All that. Um, but this idea that it's open to, to just about anybody, at least in yeah. the terms of, of the society at that time, he says it would still be stable, peaceful, and immune uh, to uh, tumult. Tumult? Tumult? Tumult. 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 Yes. I don't know where the stress is. And insurrection. <laughs> uh, but he says Madison claimed that faction was the inherent stumbling block of popular governments. Uh, mm-hmm. Not excessive size, as previously claimed. You know, there's people, you know, for several right. chapters now that right. say once it gets too big, that's the issue. He says, no, it can be as big as it can be, really. Right. Um, the problem is factionalism. Yeah. Um, and and so, my pet theory is that you it almost needs to keep expanding. Mm, yes. Um, but I don't know if that's true, but that's mm-hmm. my new pet theory. But he says, Madison was careful in his definition of a faction. And his definition is, a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. So it's this idea of not just people coming together who agree on something, but they are coming together to agree on something that would harm other people, essentially. Right, right. that's right. Um, he goes and, on. To... And, and that is not recognized in, in mm-hmm. modern society that you can have a, fa- a, a improper faction that's a majority. Yeah. Everybody's so, oh, if a majority says it's good, it's good. No, that's not true. No, not at all. Uh, but he says, conflicts of interest aren't factions, but can become so if the groups attempt to beat competitors in illicit ways or favor themselves in ways that worsen uh, the 
uh, welfare of others. So, so I think that's also something that's forgotten. It's like Correct. if 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 you disagree with somebody nowadays, they take it as you are attacking me and my rights as a person. So like, no, it's just a conflict of interests. Right. And, and yeah, and you're you're just competing. Yes. In the ideas or in the economy, and, and sometimes there's winners and sometimes there's losers. Yes, exactly. Well, get over a loser. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he says there's two kinds of factions, uh, political factions that rested on people's attachments to particular leaders or viewpoints. And so desire to uh, magnify the differences between viewpoints and then economic factions based on unequal distribution of property. Uh, he says we can control the causes of factions by either taking away the rights of freedom and organization, which he says, well, that's just awful. We would never want to do that. Or we can remove the causes of factions by removing the diversity of economic and ideological interests, which he says is impossible. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to remove factions from forming. But what he does say is that we can therefore prevent the consequences of factions. So there will always be factions no matter what. We just have to control what they're able to do. Again, recognizing real human society and our impulses. Mm -hmm. Brilliant stuff. He's not assuming that every leader is going to be given the divine right of God to rule well, or, that, or that, that the people are the just, people, yeah. mm-hmm. the, the people make mistakes. People, people will almost always mm-hmm. uh, prefer their, their faction over another faction. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just human nature and, yeah. and he's recognizing that. He's like, okay, you're not going to be able to stop it unless you have some, some cure that's worse than the disease, mm-hmm. like uh, restricting freedom of speech and assembly. Or you're not going to be able to do it, so you might as well try to try to minimize the the effect yeah. of those factions, mm-hmm. which is actually what they did. Mm-hmm. And the ways that he says we can do that uh, is that an extensive republic with many interests inherently limits the possibility and efficacy of factions forming uh, with lots of power. He says, you know, they'll form in the state governments; they'll fight each other, you know, within the states. Yeah. Sometimes maybe state against state if it yeah. really gets to that, but yeah. it'll just diffuse. Yeah. Once we get to the whole country yeah. at large. Well, you have regions against regions. And, mm-hmm. and, and the American history is replete with examples of that uh, going on uh, you know, uh, throughout history where you have a regional candidate, mm-hmm. but they can't get the traction because if you have one region trying to, trying to impose their will on the rest of them, mm-hmm. the rest of them get upset. They start joining up against them. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it ends up working out in the end. Mm-hmm. He also says that the way to, to limit the consequences of factions is also just in this representative system. Mm-hmm. Uh, it allows citizens to govern themselves through their representatives. So it's not just, you know, either, uh, you know, citizens at large voting on every single thing, which would be much more prone to factionalism or just one yes. person making all the decisions. It's right. kind of that happy mean there. Yep. He says rep- representatives are more likely to be politically intelligent, uh, but they didn't have to have outstanding virtue and extensive, uh, you know, uh, you know, abilities to, to mm-hmm. do these things. He says that extensive government supplied a large enough pool of talent for the government's purposes and providing a debating chamber that could hear all points of view. So it's big enough um, to, you know, get all of the sides and to, to work properly without also being just incredibly bloated. Right. But, and then when you talk about representatives, he, he, he mentions almost as an aside, Edmund Burke's uh, discussion, uh, discussion of the difference between a representative and a delegate. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a representative would be somebody that you that you vote for and they represent your interests as they see fit. A delegate mm-hmm. is somebody that is just going to do what you say, yeah. and uh, and that that is a common um, conflict or struggle for mm-hmm. everybody that's elected to office. Am, am I supposed to make this decision on what I think is best mm-hmm. or what the people think is best? And and uh, and I don't know what the right answer is always on that. Uh, but but it kind you, of makes, you makes see that the, local level. You mm-hmm. see that the city city halls. You see the state legislature, federal, everything, and it's a it's a real it's a real tension yeah. there. Well, it kind of makes the point. I don't know if it's right here or later, but this idea of you know, sort of, we do have almost modern day delegates in, in lobbyists. The, those are people uh, not not based on the the people, but they represent just one particular faction. Yes, yes, one faction, right, right? And that is just what they are pushing for, no matter what. Yes. They're not looking for the right decision necessarily, although Correct. I'm sure they believe. And whatever. Well, maybe mm, yes. they, they probably believe in whatever cause they're pushing. They like you're, you're giving me increasingly <laughs> confused faces. There's, they, there's possibly, they possibly, they agree. possibly agree that what they're doing is good. Yes, but but their one goal. I think it's unlikely. You think it's unlikely? Have you met a lobbyist? I have not met a met a real live lobbyist. Good. I, I hope you I should, don't. You should go through life without meeting a lobbyist. Good. Uh, but this idea of that, you know, they're, they are kind of delegates in that sense and that they're just pushing for one thing and, and that is why they're put into this yeah. position. Having said that, that I have two organizations I belong to that have lobby day. Oh. Uh, uh, Missouri Municipal League has mm-hmm. a lobby day where they want uh, city officials to go to the legislature to lobby for, for or against certain things. And the uh, Trial Lawyers Association, which I'm technically a member of, mm-hmm. and they're very influential. Interesting. Yeah. 
Um, but then he goes into what a republic actually is, and he gives a good definition here. He says, a government which derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for limited period or during good behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea, you know, it's inherently of the people, and then these people are representative by, represented by certain representatives, and they have certain terms, or they can be removed if they don't do their job well. And that is essentially just what a republic is. Mm -hmm. It also mm -hmm. says the U.S. is a mixed government of dispersed powers, or federal powers, and centralized powers, or national powers. So weird terms he uses here, uh, but state powers and, and, and national powers, essentially. It says the Constitution preserves liberty by refusing to give the executive power to form a standing uh, army except by uh, a request to the legislative uh, and also by separation of power. So they were very concerned with the executive forming a standing army, interestingly. Well, and similar, similar to the, the English concerns. Mm -hmm. And the standing army was really dangerous yeah. then because, because that, that was... Well, it's similar to what the FBI is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do I stop the FBI? That's kind of what I was thinking. It's like, well, now I we just have that. Yeah. Now we have the DHS, FBI, uh, DNI, mm -hmm. C, uh, CIA, ATF, ATF mm -hmm. DEA, and all these federal agencies. And now they're... Did you say DHS? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I did. I meant to. Yeah. Uh, all all the alphabet. They're all teaming yeah. up against us. Mm -hmm. you know, how are we supposed to stop them? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. I don't know if we can answer it. Well, I think eventually the state governments are going to have to ban them from their yeah. from their borders. Mm -hmm. Probably. It's going to be a constitutional crisis. Yeah. And a good one to have. <laughs> uh, but he goes on to say that if some part of government can make law, decide whether law has been infringed, and execute legal judgments, there is no barrier to error or arbitrary judgments. It's very important that we have the separation of powers. However, separation of powers is not a guarantee against tyranny. If all three branches concur in a plan to oppress the population, then the only solution is insurrection. Is what? The only solution is what? Insurrection. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what Even Madison, Madison has endorsed the, the, the <laughs> insurrection. He sure has. That's, that's a bad word nowadays. Yeah, that is a bad word. Uh, he also says it doesn't work properly if one branch uh, just allows another uh, to dominate, which I think yeah. is also another problem. That's what we have. No, with it's been in place since Obama. Court. It's, or, or even before. You know, we, we have this combined group of people that, that just, they all kind of agree in principle mm -hmm. what should happen and they don't jealously guard their prerogatives, yeah. you know, and, and like, Oh, the, the, the uh, president says he has a phone and a pen so he can issue executive orders and call people up and make them do stuff. And yeah. the legislature just says, Oh, okay. They should have impeached him. Yeah. You know what? They don't have any self-respect. I think, I think our, our bottom like mortal here is there should be more impeachings happening just all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the fact that our government is this big and we're not impeaching people on a regular basis mm -hmm. is insane. Yeah. Uh, they should impeach Mayorkas, who's the head of DHS, because he's letting people in on, on the southern, southern border in violation of federal law. They, and, and they ought to impeach, heck, they impeached Trump twice. Why don't we just keep doing that? We should bring back, um, oh, what's the word for it? It's slipping my mind. Uh, what they did in Athens, where you just write somebody's name on a piece of pottery and mm. then they're kicked out. Um, not yeah. banishment. Not shunning them, but it's it's the same principle. Yes. Just get out. Yes. We don't want you anymore. Mm, I agree. I think that's what we should yeah. do. I don't know where they'd go. Yeah. Probably be welcomed as heroes in France. We're going to have a lot of anti-French slander in the next couple episodes. I'm, I'm feeling it right now. Well, the next one for sure. Yeah. Uh, but he also says this idea of the mixed constitution uh, allows multiple veto points to allow the common people to defend their legitimate interests. Yes. Says the common people have a voice in the House of Representatives, a filtered voice in the Senate, and an even more filtered voice in the President. Yeah. Says each electing body would elect better off and better educated persons than themselves. In theory. In theory. Yeah. But then also that has not happened with the mm -hmm. Senate, of course, with the 26th Amendment. I um, can't remember the number. Yes. I always the forget the number. direct election of U.S. Senators. I always want to say repeal the 19th, but that's giving women that's the vote. Women the vote. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Don't want to repeal that one. Uh, but he ends this section. <laughs> do not shake your hand. I didn't like do baby. anything. Yes, just, you did. I, the listener <laughs> saw what I was doing. I was doing nothing. Uh -huh. Sure. <laughs> um, he also says to end this section that after creating the most durable constitution in the world, uh, Madison created the Bill of Rights, which stated what Congress was forbidden to violate. Yep. Uh, he says, but this initially only bound Congress and the federal government, but this was later extended to states with the 14th Amendment. So an important distinction to make there. True. And then we get into the last section, which is the roads not taken. This was interesting. I had really? never really heard about any of these. Oh, really? Yeah, I never, yeah. 
okay. you don't seem too interested, but I'll, I'll get really, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's interesting stuff, you know, about Jefferson's Jefferson. theory mm-hmm. of, uh, of having the, like the little wards. Yeah. About, you know, Jefferson was kind of a kook. Yeah. That's, that's uh, the like, vibe I get from he, him. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, he's obviously a brilliant guy and, and all that stuff, but he really believed that we can have an agrarian society. Um, and he, he had no concept of what the industrial revolution was doing and was going to do mm-hmm. and what kind of financial system you have to yeah. keep this country uh, uh, going forward and to feed all these people and to keep us prosperous. And, you know, I think he just glorified the family farm. Mm-hmm. And I've not been a farmer, although I think I should have been. Yes, of course. But uh, that's a joke. Um, but um, I know enough to know that's a tough, mm-hmm. tough way of life and even and back then when everything was done by hand it was really really mm-hmm. hard and he just acts like it's just the you know the ideal yeah. life but you know when people are given the opportunity they left the farms mm-hmm. you know because it's just a brutal physical sun up there's a poet sun, there's a poem down. by the yes. roman poet horace about yes. that what is Where it? He, I, I, I don't have it oh, memorized. Oh, come on. I mean, it's a long poem. It's Roman poetry. Well, you can't. It's in Latin. Well, the way, so? But, but the point is, you know, yes. it's, it's this big, long speech about, you know, how, how beautiful the life of the farmer is. You know, he sits yes. by the, the, by the, under the tree and he just yes. watches the water flow. Uh, and then at the end of the, the poem, it, it's revealed in like four lines that it's the, the speech of a money lender named Alpheus. And he's <laughs> presumably trying to get people to, to, to borrow money from him and start their own farms. He's mm. like, you know, you'll own yeah. your own oh, things. Oh, yeah, and yeah, you'll, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll be, you know, with the fatherland and stuff like that. And it's revealed <laughs> that it was, you know, the, the voice of a, of a money lender. Yes. Uh, but to get to the, the roads not taken, these ideas that Jefferson and Hamilton had uh, that were not enshrined in the Constitution. Like you said, um, Jefferson was very big on the agrarian society. Uh, but he believed that it was um, uh, good for every generation to imagine its own future and rebuild mm. institutions. Uh, but he was more democratic, radical, and impracticable, impracticable than Madison. Yeah. Uh, he wanted a lot of concessions to pure democracy. Like you said, he proposed ward republics, which were small, self-governing, wholly participatory areas of government uh, that would be the basis of militia bands and providers of education and a very uh, small social welfare system. Yeah, it's a recipe for warlords yeah. is really what it is, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, he believed we would not oppress our near neighbors uh, just kind of because, you know, we kind yeah. of look out for our neighbors as just right. in general. Just, these ward republics wouldn't try to oppress each other. Uh, and so he says it solved the issue of factionalism and it would kind of be built on a period, pyramid system of indirect election. Yeah. And we, we elect ahead of the ward and they elect, you know, further up to yeah, get to the a, highest point. It's a more utopian gobbledygook. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. Uh, but like you said, he imagined an extensive America founded on small-scale agriculture. Uh, he was, interestingly, hostile to slavery, but thought that there was no remedy. Um, Jefferson, of course, owned slaves. Um, but he believed that black people and Indians were intellectually inferior to whites, yeah. and so our societies could not mix. Uh, he says black people should be sent to Africa, and Indians should either become docile farmers or be exterminated. And those were his words, yeah. um, which is pretty rough. Right. Um, we had somebody come up uh, on the topic of slavery. I told you about this. I don't know if I talked about it on the podcast, um, but um, an economist talking about the 1619 uh, Project. Oh, of yeah. Of course, the project by the New York Times claiming that America really started in 1619 with the arrival of the first slaves. Right. Um, and that all of America is just founded on slavery. And it was a guy pretty well debunking just that whole theory True. that we were founded on slavery. That's right. Um, but uh, this idea that we should uh, deport slaves essentially was not like unpopular. It was very popular oh, yeah. among anti-slavery. I didn't realize this, but um, why am I blanking on his name? The Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in favor of, of sending all the slaves uh, to, to colonies in Africa. Well, the uh, the country in Africa, Liberia, uh, Liberia mm-hmm. was a bunch of former slaves mm-hmm. that were shipped back over there. Yeah. And, I, uh, I knew that much, yes. but I didn't know how right. extensive it was oh, and how yeah. late into history it was. Oh, I know yeah. Liberia was, was founded pretty early on yeah. into America's history, but, but up until the Civil there War. There were even civil rights uh, activists, the you know, more radical ones in the uh, 1960s, really? that were saying we should go back to Africa. Huh. Yeah, advocating the, you know, the, the black population to go back to Africa. Yeah, but, but, this... but uh, the, the, the uh, Africans were like, no. <laughs> we're not taking you here yeah uh, <laughs> i'm just joking i i just made that up. that's funny uh but but the speaker mentioned you know there there was even a, a town that was founded by abraham lincoln essentially uh, but was later 
pretty much abandoned uh, in, on the west coast of Africa somewhere. That was his plan to just send a bunch of slaves yeah. over there, which is interesting. Well, it, and it, it makes, uh, I guess we're going off a far afield, but it, it makes a little bit of sense because there, were, there was this, this feeling and this belief that uh, Africans, African-Americans, they didn't consider them African-Americans, mm-hmm. they just considered them slaves, yeah. were somehow intellectually and morally inferior mm-hmm. they were they were some sort of subhumans and the same was true of it uh, of irish mm-hmm. when the irish came up is that in the book or is yeah, that, I okay so. so the I, I remember reading about it again uh last day or two um the irish when they came over really after especially after the potato potato famine uh era uh they were so underfed and malnourished they were all very small mm-hmm. And so they, the, and the English thought they were subhuman. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. in American society, they would, they had a tremendous discrimination against mm-hmm. the Irish where they, they would say the Irish need not apply their signs and in, in storefronts saying no Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so uh, it's kind of interesting how prevalent it was about different subgroups. Yeah. Um, uh, not just, you know, the slaves and the African, African people of African descent, it, it, it crossed different cultures too. And so, um, if we ever do reparations, we are part Irish, and we're going to get some of that. Uh, sure, they were indentured servants. That is it true. It's basically a slave. That is true. Uh, back to the book with with Hamilton's ideas. Uh, he did not share the opposition to trade and industry uh, that Jefferson had. He said the future must be in developing American manufacturers um, and uh, you know securing international trade. And so, a national bank uh, was essential for these for these commercial reasons. He says, the new government should nationalize as many issues as possible because a central administration of commercial law and a sound financial system were key to development of trade and industry. I don't think we should nationalize every single issue. I don't think that's a... Well, a well he, what he's talking about is economics. That's you know, true. the interstate commerce was his big push. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, you know, that, that, that there has to be uh, a single policy, single economic policy for the nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that applied to everybody, yeah. and and you can't have like in the Continental Congress. I think they still had like tariffs between mm-hmm. the colonies. Mm-hmm. They certainly did before the Revolution. They they would tariff each other, yeah. and that, that this just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I think he's really primarily talking yeah. about. This is the economic side. You have to have a national government that asserts control over those policies, and I think he's right about all mm-hmm. that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, he actually has a quote here that I want to read. It says, Hamilton was killed before it became apparent that mm. he had won the argument and that the future of the United States lay in exploiting the vast wealth of the hinterland and becoming an industrial powerhouse. His lack of success in his own lifetime was not surprising. His vision of a successful state was quite literally monarchical. Like the Florentines desperate for order after the rise and fall of Savonarola's Republic, he envisaged a king at the head of affairs and senators appointed for life. His lack of experience of the affairs of the states that had invented their own institutions before and during the insurrection made him tone deaf to the American hatred of all things monarchical and aristocratic. True. And kind of to end, he says, Hamilton's insights have either been neglected or so taken for granted we don't even know they're his today. And he says, there's now an idea of achieving Jeffersonian ends by Hamiltonian means, mm. um, which I do think is is pretty prominent, this idea of you know, securing more democratic things by, by nationalizing more stuff, mm, which true. I think is what you were talking about earlier right. with relying on the federal government to solve every problem Every ever. problem ever, yes. Yeah, which is an issue. But that is... It's a hazard. It's a danger. The, the end of, of this chapter yeah. on the, the American founding. What were your thoughts overall? Uh, like I said, it's a good summary because mm-hmm. there's just so much material yeah. there. And, but it, philosophically, uh, it, it was... It, it was revolutionary in its simplicity, really. Mm-hmm. You know that hey, we're we're uh, we can't create. You know they talk about a more perfect union. Mm-hmm. Well, it it was perfect in the sense that it acknowledges that we're not perfect, mm-hmm. and we need a system set up to keep us from screwing it all up. Yeah. You know, we're all gonna we're gonna we're gonna do our best to screw up the system. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's a guarantee. And so you have to have all these these different competing interests funneled through the system so that we can't we can only screw it up so much or at least slows us down <laughs> and, and and that i think is the key to the entire system mm-hmm. and and just acknowledging that you know that calvinist view that we're all sinners yeah and um and, and that we're destined to to make mistakes mm-hmm. i just think that's just, you know brilliant yeah couldn't couldn't i, I mean there are some changes, obviously, have made over time. Uh, like, like you said, you know, Hamilton's theories about more of a central government from financial concerns. You know, the, the a federal bank uh, were not really contemplated mm-hmm. or, or agreed upon initially. But um, you know, the, the 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 framework was such that it was limber enough 
to to expand and contract and, and to deal with all these different crises over the, the history of the United yeah. States. And it, it really was mm-hmm. unprecedented and, and still is, I think, the best form of government. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, kind of what you were saying, but just this idea, I know we've had sort of inklings of this in, in chapters before this with, you know, Locke um, in, in Harrington and stuff like that, this idea of, you know, people having the power, but they all seem to still fall back on, well, monarchy is still theoretically the best or some sort of Correct. aristocracy is still theoretically the best. This idea right. that there are just some people that would just inherently be better, um, you know, yes. at serving. And I think that is true to some extent. There are definitely people that would be better at serving than others just by their nature. Right. Um, but this idea that, you know, they are necessary for the government to function is just completely, I think, demolished in a way in this uh, American system. This idea Correct. that, you know, no matter what, theoretically, if things function properly, you know, uh, we, we do have checks on all of that stuff. But like you said, we just have come to the point, and of course, Madison knew this, that if everyone in all of these branches agrees on everything, there's not much we can do to stop it. Correct. Except insurrection. And and and, uh, and, and, and just, just saying the counter, arg- counter argument of that, or the, maybe the same argument that, is if we all agree on something, maybe that's what should happen anyway. Yeah. You know, but but I, I see it as a form of corruption mm-hmm. now because well, they're they're doing it surreptitiously. Well, it's also the case that you know Madison had no idea how many federal agencies there would be. True. And for all of them to agree on everything, they have so much power now. It's like well, he would have never envisioned that, and they have no that's checks true. on them at all by us. Right. Well, they're they're a creation of the legislature, sure. and they've just abdicated the responsibility and and. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what he was he was talking about yeah. because really they just delegated to the executive yeah because I mean I guess uh, technically the check on them is the, the president could fire all of them but well I mean the legislature could just not fund it next year that is true you know that I mean if, if you get if, if you get was it 435 um, copies of me in the house and, <laughs> and 100 copies of me in the senate um, a lot of those federal agencies would come to a, a, an abrupt end and, and would and there would be all those people would be out of work. Yeah. Um, not every single federal employee. I'm not saying that, but mm-hmm. but certainly, there's a way to correct it. We can correct it immediately. Mm-hmm. I mean, immediately. Yeah. Uh, and it's gonna have. There's gonna be a correction one way or the other. I mean, the the, the economy is either gonna collapse or it's not. Um, it, it, because I mean, at some point, especially with interest rates going up, we're gonna have. Well, we're only have money to pay the debt. Mm-hmm. You know, the the uh, the interest on the debt. Yeah. Yeah, because we're not actually paying the debt. We're just yeah. adding well, to the we're debt. Just, yeah. We're just paying the interest on the debt, which is eating up more and more of the budget. Which I think and, we've gotten to the point. I don't know if we... Are we even paying the interest fully? Oh, yeah. We're paying are the we? interest oh, on God. it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's going to get... It's, it, it, I don't know if it's the single biggest expenditure. I think the Department of Defense is still That's a little bit bigger. Thinking. Yeah. But, uh, but it's going to... I mean, if the interest rates go up another percentage point or two, yeah. it's going to be the number one... It's just There's just uh, so much money that's expense. just essentially going into the void with, with paying the interest. and, and well, well, they don't even audit anything. Yeah. We have no idea where all this stuff is going. Well, anyway, so let's yeah, go so back that's, to That's the, another rant. That's, that's a whole that's, other that's rant. That's more of a practical yes. thing. But I, I think, um, you know, the, as, you, as you're saying, it's just it, it, it's just a system that, that's set up um, to, to put checks on, on what the government can do if it works, you know, if it's functioning. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. But everybody agrees that that's, everybody who's elected agrees to it we're kind of screwed. Yeah, exactly. You know, we just got to get new people in there. It's hard to get elected, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like our congressional district starts here. It goes all the way to Columbia yeah. and then south to Jeff City. It goes all the way up into St. Charles County. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a tough That's a tough race for just a common Joe to win. But the other thing I was going to say is that there, there's a certain meritocracy to it, too, because it, there is no aristocracy mm-hmm. formally. You know, yeah. you don't have to be from a certain... Um, pedigree to be president or anything else. You can you can just you know you just have to get enough votes or enough support and be of a certain age, mm-hmm. and then you're yeah, in. Exactly. You know? That is true. Any other thoughts? I don't know. American what are your thoughts? Any other? I mean, thoughts? I really like the the chapter. That yeah. was a good summary. But you're looking forward like to the French Revolution next chapter. Yeah, I guess I should mention we're in person today. We haven't been in person for the past couple of weeks. I've been in person every day of my life. That's I, 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 <laughs> sure, whatever. Uh, but yeah, we're we're in person recording, and our t-shirt competition is still ongoing. And we Nobody's still have to. We have still have to order the shirts. Still have to order the shirts. Yes, yeah. we'll so, get on that. Leave a review, an interesting review. You might win a shirt. Leave any review. Leave any review. I yeah, think the I first think one to leave a review gets a sheet. Gets a shirt. <laughs> Pretty much. Leave a review on our podcast. Yes. We'll, we'll give you. We'll send you a shirt. Review. Most interesting. It just has to yeah. be interesting. Uh, one star, no comment. Get a t-shirt. <laughs> Five but, stars. but you have to you have to contact us and let us know 
Because uh, other, because I don't have any way of contacting people based on. Reviews. Well, yeah, they have to tell us where to send it. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what I'm saying. They so have they have to tweet us. at us, right? They can tweet at us, or they can email us unlimited opinions podcast at gmail dot com. I thought we had know. an email address. We do have an email address. No, we don't. Yeah. We're high tech. And nobody emails us, but we have an email address. Maybe I should email us. I why would I you should do that? I should set up a ghost account, make a review, and then uh, win the the shirt contest. So you could have two. Of the same shirt because you're getting one for yourself. Oh, that's anyway, right. I'm going to buy one yeah. too. And I'm buying it. So that doesn't do <laughs> You're just anything. buying yourself two shirts. <laughs> that's right. Two identical shirts. That, the contest will end, though. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, Maybe our listener, yeah, our, our secret uh, secret consistent listener, will uh, we make have, a We have comment. a couple consistent listeners. Really? Yeah, we do. Do we know who they are? I know of two consistent listeners. Oh. But, I, but I see, because I get rough. Um, you know, location-based yeah. stats, and I see similar people. Uh, yeah. There's a, been a consistent person from Vietnam that's been listening. From hmm. Hanoi. What? Hanoi. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But, talking, but that, that's the name? Because that's a city. That's a city. Yeah, oh. I don't have anybody's names. I don't. I, I do not, yeah, but I'm not just okay. seeing names of people list. I get general at, geographic at, areas. At first, I thought you were saying Ahoy, and I thought, that's not uh, Vietnamese for Hanoi. No, okay. it is not. Hmm. No, Hanoi. Hanoi. It is, it's somebody that's listening from Hanoi. I wonder why. We're interesting. I really do wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had some consistent listeners from France, from Germany, and stuff like that. France. Yeah. We do have we do have some consistent listeners. So thank you if you've if you've made it all this way, and thank you, thank yes. you for listening. But this has been season four, episode seventeen of Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. said you you didn't want to go an hour and a half we went hour 20 hour 20 yeah just about very close